Okay, I am. We are live. Hello, humans. Uh, not what I was expecting today. No, it's still YouTube. At me. We're just gonna. We're just gonna move forward with the flashing of the ring. <clears throat> okay. It has the wrong icon. Yeah. I have no idea what that means, other than it is upset. Other people see us and hear us. <clears throat> now buffering, now buffering. On the YouTube end. Do we want... Okay, we can do that too. Okay. So, I guess... Not going anywhere. Okay. Give me one second. And you can green screen me? Oh. Mm, do my video and then... Okay. So I have to give up then I'm there. So you're not going to be able to see me. Okay. <clears throat> be able to pick the stream up from me. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Does hold that on. make sense? Okay. I'm hanging up the stream. That worked. Did it? Yeah. I see us on YouTube now. And you see me over on the side and you're on the other side? Yeah, and I don't have, I have my green crazy ass background. Mm hmm. I mean, I could probably figure out a way to, to green screen it, which would be fun. <laughs> uh, second display. Trying to figure out which way centers Filters. me. I keep picking the wrong direction. Add a filter, I think. chroma key, okay, green, sure. And then what do I want to do as your as your chroma key though? I don't know, but the gray is kind of cool. Yeah, now it's so that's your chroma key. And then I guess we take a picture. Let me see if I can add a picture. Okay. For fun. Like th this is just, we're just being silly at this point. We, we are, this was not, this was not necessary. I gotta find a yeah. picture for my desktop. Oh no, I don't have any cool picture. Wait, okay, hold on. Um, you're gonna have a, a botched picture. Oh, I didn't like that. Okay. And then we put that below. Oh, those are cool. Yeah, I think I showed you this. Yeah. Like a couple mid journey weeks ago, things. Mid journey, yeah. And then let's change the chroma key. Oh. This is so dumb. <laughs> uh, so, like this. And then you disappear. Like that. No, wait. No. All right. <laughs> I'm seeing everything on slight delay and it's yeah. deeply amusing. Hmm. Okay. Okay. There you go. You have a space background as you demand in your in your rider. I I deeply appreciate this. I deeply appreciate yeah, this. No problem. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, now people are saying that I'm quiet. Okay, hold on, hold on. Um, why am I quiet? Well, one... You are also short. <clears throat> I mean, I'm as tall as I need to be. Well, I don't know <laughs> if I can... Yeah, I don't know if I can make fix this problem. Okay. So this is me... I can fix... Let me... <clears throat> I guess I can balance this out. Yeah, I'm. Uh, this is the audio... All right, I will turn your volume down three decibels. Okay. Let's see there. I think this is this should be balanced. I'll keep an eye on it and and sort of watch to make sure that our audio levels are are getting roughly the same. Okay, there you go. Um, let's begin. Um, <laughs> oh everyone, man! Welcome to a uh, live episode of Stronghast where you see the nightmarish sausage campaign <laughs> this is 
inadvertently true today. Mm -hmm, inadvertently mm -hmm. very true today. Yeah, yeah. YouTube All just right. refuses your software. Did not permit it. Yeah. Is it your ingestion I, server? Is it your software? I I don't know. It was giving me ingestion server errors, mm. though, so I'm going to blame them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, <sighs> well, that lovely background of the sky is fake. It's fake. I designed it with mid-journey. I can't remember. I think it was Italy has banned the use of chat GPT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, I mean, this is a race. So anyone who bans the most successful consumer software that's ever been created will <laughs> fall behind in the use and the comp like the competitiveness of this. So it's a, uh, and the thing that they're asking for is impossible. Like, what are they asking for? Well, they want to um, make sure that you control what data goes into it, that it doesn't violate uh, copyright. There's a whole bunch of like oh, requirements, yeah. right? And like this stuff is impossible. So, so all that's going to happen is is that Italians aren't going to be able to write uh, hilarious poems in the style of Snoop Dogg. About their grandmother. All right, all right. Yeah. So what will they? What will they do? Um, but yeah, like I think this is. I mean, I'm not sure how where you've been at. I'm still trying to understand how this software works. Figure out what its limitations are. Figure out what's yeah. good at. Figure out what it's bad at. And um, and yet at the same time, like like it's going to get really interesting when you get the plugins, when you get access to the API when you can start to do a lot more interesting stuff with it. So right now it's all fairly rudimentary. You're just talking to it. So Yeah. I I have I have a, a take I need to take the time to write down where folks who are digitally advanced are going to benefit from this by being able to save money on not hiring creatives mm -hmm. to write and create for them. Whereas folks who have limited resources uh, or limited digital understanding aren't going to be able to take advantage of it and they're going to fall further behind and creatives are going to suffer the most. Right. And it's just sort of like, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the like there are, there are like one group of people and I have a few friends that are like this. They're like, this yeah. technology is amazing. Why doesn't it do everything? Yeah. Right. Like just from day, like why, like why doesn't it completely write me articles that are really great? Why doesn't it do all this stuff? And, and it's a tool and yeah. Right. And so the, the, the people who are going to really succeed with this are the ones who use it as a tool who are able to go like, this is a different kind of paintbrush. And mm -hmm. if you're going to create content that you're hoping is correct, you're an idiot that, that, this is going to create a horrible lying uh, nonsense. But as I've said many times before, right? If you want a brainstorming partner that never runs out of energy, then that's what it's great for. If you want something that can do really rudimentary type stuff, like uh, look through a whole bunch of comments on YouTube live and check to see if any of them are questions. And if they are questions, then edit the grammar lightly so that its spellings are correct and present that to Fraser so that he can answer the question. That's an example of something that maybe somebody is working on with ChatGPT. Yeah. So and and I know people who are just using it to write their web copy, like mm -hmm. the 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 like terms of service, the privacy statements and yeah. Yeah. yeah so you does so if you do that you deserve to get what's coming to you, which is that, <laughs> is that, you know, the two, one of two things are going to happen. One, um, you will make mistakes and people will catch them and you look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. Two, Google will detect what you've done and send your website into SEO jail. Um, and three, I guess that's a th bonus third thing is that you will be participating in a race to the bottom where, yeah. uh, you know, like if, if everybody had a gadget in their house that pooped out gold, eventually gold would be worthless. It's true. And so it's if you true. think that you're going to somehow in the long run 
game this system by creating free content. Everybody's creating free content. Like it is a race to the bottom. It's just going to be this horrible mess of, of algorithmically generated glop. And, yeah. and people are going to abandon the websites because it's all just this regurgitated garbage. Yeah. Or they're going to seek out other higher quality forms of content delivered by human beings in an authentic manner, perhaps in podcast form. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. So far, uh, at least the two of us have distinctive voices and I don't know about you, but oh, people you could... can know when I've written something. You could voice written voice. Maybe. I mean, you could, we could absolutely yeah. feed our speech into like 11 that lives, I agree with. and it could yeah. generate us talking. No problem. Piece of cake. That yeah. A person would, would not be able to tell the difference that people could but listen. written voice. Yeah, sure. But, it, but, but even that, I don't think is that much of a, like, yes, I don't think anybody but knows my voice. I don't think a person be. could okay. read my, my writing and go, that's Fraser. Okay. It happens. I Apparently people can read mine because I've had random things that I've written get put places and no allocation. And people are like, hey, I think you were copyrighted over here. This looks like something you wrote. Mm. So, um, But the, you know, someone's mentioning in the chat, uh, Carolyn B, that uh, – at PlayStation, students using Mid Journey for game graphics can be done with a small group of people. Yeah. So what's so what's happening is is you're getting, for example, I've seen 3D artists complain about this that they yeah. like instead of designing characters and then animating them, they go to they, their boss is forcing them to go to Mid Journey to design characters, and then mm -hmm. they take that character and then they implement it in 3D. And yeah. shortly, the, the AI is going to implement that character in 3D and help them animate it. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing this. And, and no person can design characters as quickly as Midjourney can. So right. one skilled artist with good prompts can design 100 characters or 1,000 characters in a day. Yeah. And then can, those could can be brought in and animated. And so, you're, so one designer or animator can do the work that used to be 10 people. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's fine, right? Like, I think, you know, like we've seen this a thousand times before that you bring in the, the, a, a machine, like a excavator, and it can do the work of a hundred people with shovels, yeah. but, the, but, but the work is different. And so in the past you were designing, you were an artist, you were designing characters. Now right. you are just implementing graphics done by, by an algorithm. And so you're not yeah. doing what you're doing is no longer the job that you used to do. And I think that is definitely going to be the problem. And so, yeah. um, but this is like, like, like this is us rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic when we talk about this kind of thing, <laughs> right? Like it's, uh, someone used this term that I really like that this is the least weird day you are going to experience for the rest of your life. Today, this day today is the least bizarre, confusing, unnerving, unsettling, weird day that you're going to experience for the rest of your life. That every day from this day forward will be weirder, more unsettling, more destabilizing, more complicated, more unnerving until it's paper clips all the way down. So I don't like it. Get off my lawn. Old man yelling at clouds. <laughs> well, yeah, I, like... Like, I don't mind as long as we stick the landing in the end. Yeah. So, so that's it. That's, that's all I, you know, as long as we don't end up losing control to a wildly more intelligent gadget than us, then, then all of this changes. We've always changed, right? Like humanity's yeah. always developed new tools and and culture has undergone dramatic change and people have always been resistant to change and people have always embraced change and in the end change happens whether we want it to happen or not um the hope is I just want to, towards good i want technology to liberate humans to be more creative not imprison them under the creativity of the machine right 
Because the creativity of the machine is just generative algorithms that rolled the dice. Sure, but you can, I mean, humanity, like, just because chess machines exist doesn't mean that humans don't want to play chess, right? Chess is, more people are playing chess now than than have ever played chess, despite there being computers out there which can beat the greatest champions in chess. So so I, I don't think that that from an artistic creativity standpoint there's ever going to be a threat because like art is about the process for you as a person not about you becoming a machine to acquire the outcome right yeah but you just talked about how digital 3d animators are mm -hmm. being asked to implement mm -hmm mid-journey sure characters yeah and it's just like that hurts my soul well but that's like that's like saying that a person who was digging a hole with a shovel is being asked to run an excavator right the work is different or you know i mean you can give a more of a, a more elaborate version that's like a person who um uh is a chef who makes very I don't know, there's like a million jobs that a person used to do that were very complicated and required a lot of labor and were replaced by a machine. And the person moved from being the person who actually did the work to the person who supervises the machine. Like this process yeah. happens all the time. Um, and, and so I think for the person who used to be an artist who was designing characters for a video game, like that sucks because you are fundamentally yeah. doing, you're not doing the job that you wanted to be yeah. doing, but you were doing work for hire. Like you, like you, you are a cog in someone else's machine. And so like, although it sucks, it's kind of to be anticipated that, you know, and we didn't know which jobs the computers were going to come from. But yeah. come for, but we knew the job, the computers were coming for jobs. Yeah. And we just didn't realize that it was going to be our jobs that were going to be the ones on the chopping block. Like yeah. science explainers, podcasters, we are absolutely <laughs> on the chopping block. Yeah. No question. Way before dishwashers or, right? Like, like it's going to be us. Like some, somebody could very easily now, not very easily. Somebody with medium levels of difficulty could create an astronomy podcast where Chad GPT is writing the scripts and Eleven Labs is producing the audio and Mid Journey is creating the, the pretty pictures and they could release this thing and it would be a acceptable facsimile of a podcast that for a and large number of people, would it would be perfectly fine. And, and this is where I'm allowed to be sad. Mm. And it it's just sort of like all the radio stations that are now done programmatically in instead of having like a human being there selecting the music and chatting with the audience where it's now just like voice snippets that have been recorded and are put together in different ways and you end up with the sameness from station to station that didn't used to be there. That's just bad algorithms. Right. But when you tune things based strictly on what brings in the most revenue, you lose the long tail. And it's like, we were mm -hmm. doing so good at getting a long tail. No way. I a hundred percent disagree with you. Like we, this is how we get the long tail. Like, like you could like right now, if you sign up for Spotify, you'll get a personalized DJ who will explain the music to you, tell you what they're setting up. So like there's a show that I used to really enjoy listening to as a, as a kid. It was like on, they, they would like play a bunch of music, but they would explain sort of the history of the music and the people behind yeah. it and some interesting stories and some little snippets of interviews and then they play the music. Mm -hmm. And, and so imagine one of those that's completely personalized to the music you're listening to to the, the exact music that you're enjoying right now, but it is giving you all of that interesting information. Like there's no way 
that writers could write that stuff because it's just too individualized. So, you know, anytime there, you describe, like, anytime you describe this being mediocre, that's, so, so there, that's there's I a think dichotomy. The, yeah, that's, but I think that's the, the, the mistake that you're making is that it's all going to be amazing. So, so I think there's a dichotomy. When, when it comes to the free-to-air radio stations, there, there's research showing that diversity is being lost, that it's much harder to get record, new records played, that it is basically three or four algorithms that control all of the radio stations in the U.S. And so for content that isn't personalized, we're losing the long tail. But you're right, we are getting the long tail on services like Spotify, yeah, what's Netflix. what's a radio station? Some of us have tornadoes and we turn on the radio to find out if we're going to die or not. Sure. Sure. But that's not you. Do you listen to podcasts I, or do you listen to radio stations? Both. Do you listen to Spotify or do you listen to radio stations? I, I actually pretty much listen to uh, radio stations or Apple Music. Yeah, sure. Um. So you prefer uh, – now, is that because you don't want to take the time to customize your Spotify account or because you're just like listening in your car? Um, so Apple like Music – so don't, The ads so, don't bother you? <laughs> so, so first of all, our cars are not smart enough to have streaming services. Mm. Um, so there we have to use free to air in the car. Um, and, and I listen to actual radio because – it is more likely to introduce me to things that I didn't know about previously. Whereas the algorithm is like, we shall play these same 12 people for you forever. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's like I said, it's a weird dichotomy between what the free to air stuff is. And there's a digital divide that's going to grow around this. Um, when we were kids, we could always find that one eclectic, human on the radio even if it was at like 5 a.m playing dr demento but why are people listening to us when they could be listening to science friday on npr so people listening to us have technological literacy mm -hmm. this is me being sad for all the people who don't either have the funding or the technology access or the technological know-how whose how world is getting funding, smaller. How much funding did we get to, to begin Astronomy Cast? We, we got nothing. And then our audience, whom we love dearly, right. has funded for us to keep going. Yeah. But our, our audience, who I love dearly, is mostly affluent humans. And this is why we're able to exist. But... Sure. But like... Like anyone can start a podcast and it's yeah. free. And, it, and yeah. you can scale that up to an enormous number of listeners and it remains free. Yeah. And anyone can listen to any podcast and it's free. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't understand your There, there are still people concern. who don't understand what podcasts sure. are or don't have the sure. bandwidth. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm worried about those humans. Um. Yeah, but I mean, like, people not having bandwidth, that's an issue. That's a deeper issue. I mean, there's, a, like, mm -hmm. podcasts are, like, one of the least important things that you could get with that additional bandwidth. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So, so there, there's just a segment of society that they're listening to free-to-air radio, they are listening to free-to-air TV, and their world is getting smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. So that's weird. So we don't get... Um, Free to air TV in Canada, really? In the same way. Well, I yeah. guess your country is so big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then free to air radio, we have one channel, right? So we have we have one okay. we have one TV channel, mm -hmm. CBC, and then we have one radio channel, CBC, um, and then you get commercial radio stations filled with ads, and you get cable television with tv shows and so you pay your 150 dollars a month and you get to watch tv shows so we have free to air television most places you can get anywhere from five to 20 stations depending on 
how big a city you're nearby. Mm. And you're looking at between AM and FM, several dozen radio stations that you have access to. Hmm. That sounds and nice. Yeah, ex except they're like owned by four companies. Mm. So it's the same algorithm. Yeah. And that's why I'm sad. Um, we should do our jobs. Yeah, we should. We yeah. should. And this isn't and even the rant that I had planned. <laughs> and you're going to like the rant. The rant is, I hate Picard, but I love it. <laughs> I haven't I watched Picard. it yet. I hate Picard season three because I love it so much. That's my rant. That's, I, I, I'm I seeing lots of calls that Jerry Ryan uh, should get her own show. And I'm here for that, even though I have no idea why they're saying it. Yeah, I I don't know if I can if I, if I can be, proceed with my rant without spoiling it, but okay. Um, but yeah, damn you, Picard, damn you. <laughs> All right, should we press the record button? Uh, yes, let's press the record button. All right, I have hit record. Okay. Astronomy Cast episode six seventy nine hypervelocity stars. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, the publisher of Universe Today. With me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well, although if you hear any sniffling, it's because this is the worst pollen year of several years. All the trees are far mm -hmm. too happy and far too fertile. Yeah, like. My annual reminder, if there's anything wrong with you right now, it's because of spring. It's allergies. Yeah, you like, like maybe if you not, if you live in the Southern hemisphere and you're moving towards winter, uh, but whenever trees do their thing for you in your neighborhood, that is the, like, are you feeling a little tired? It's allergies. Are you feeling a little, uh, out of it? Allergies, cold allergies. It's just, it's all allergies. Blame everything on allergies. But I'm hearing that for those who don't have the cloudy pollen-filled skies that I have, there are northern lights right mm -hmm. now. Have you gotten to see any? So we tried. So it was like really cloudy and I'm like, oh, we're doomed. But Carla like showed me a picture of the aurora activity here and it's just like off the charts. Yeah, and yeah. So, but it was cloudy. I'm like, oh, okay. So went to bed. And then I woke up around two in the morning and it was clear skies. And I went and I stood at the window and I looked out to the north and I could see the green aurora glow wow. far away. And I waited for like 10 minutes and nothing really interesting happened. And I went, nah, I'm going back to bed. So, okay, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. So, so in theory, it's uh, this is it. This is our time. But hopefully the weather's supposed to improve later on this this week. So we'll get some more shots at it. And as we get closer and closer to Solar Max, everyone needs to install their Aurora alerts on yep. their phone because we're going to get more and more opportunities. Don't ask us for recommendations. We have no idea True. what's a good piece True. of software to install. So most stars in the Milky Way are trapped in here with us, doomed to orbit around and around and around. But a few have found a way out and escape into the freedom of intergalactic space. How do stars reach escape velocity? never to return. And we'll talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. That was one of your best intros <laughs> in a long time. That was awesome. And we're back. I, I think about like the Watchmen, you know, that classic line. I'm not, I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me. So, um, um, hypervelocity stars, what's going on? I, so basically, there are stars out there that are going 50 kilometers per second, 100 kilometers per second, more than that in some cases, faster around the galaxy than the stars around them. They have been accelerated in a variety of different ways, and some of them uh, actually end up looking like comets because of the combination of mass loss and motion. And... I, I don't know where to start. There's so much awesomeness right. to look at. Myra, maybe? Is Myra a good place to start? Well, maybe. I mean, it's not it's not leaving, but it's definitely moving fast. So, so yes. then I guess, like, just in general, what are the motions? What's a normal motion of a star in the Milky Way? 
so so this is where it gets trickstery. It's it's you look at what is the average motion of all of the stars in a given area, and the high velocity ones are the ones that are going 50 to 100 kilometers per second faster than the average where they are. And so the velocity changes depending on where you are, and there's a lot of complications. So basically, these are the ones that are just going significantly faster than the things around them. But in the case of some of the most quickly moving ones, they're actually moving 10% to 30% the speed of light. Right. So like, like when we think about, say, the, the solar system, Earth is going 30 kilometers per second around the sun and is in orbit. And yes. the closer you get to the sun, the faster you go, the farther you get from the sun, the slower you go. It doesn't work that way in the Milky Way, though. Everything is roughly moving at the same speed in the hundreds of kilometers per second range. 250? Yeah. You, you get regional differences because you'll have like this open cluster is moving together. That group of things is moving together. And, and so this is where you get the really cool dynamics that you can start to see. One of my favorite things about open clusters, which is not where we were going with Myra, we will return yes. to Myra. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get back to that. Um, so with open clusters in particular, you have these groups of stars that form together out of the same collapsing molecular cloud. And star systems, when they're small and compact, I end up having lots of multi-star interactions. And wherever you get three stars interacting, you can often get one star getting flung away. And so when we find these hypervelocity stars, quite often you can figure out what is their three-dimensional motion through the galaxy and work it backwards mm. and be like, oh, that open cluster got rid of you. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Ejected. So, yeah. so what is the method that astronomers use to measure the speed of stars? We look at two different things. One is what's called proper motion. This is how the stars appear to be moving relative to one another in the plane of the sky. This is the kind of thing that Gaia was designed to do like no other telescope has been able to do previously. Um, we see most stars over the course of a human lifetime won't really appear to move relative to the background galaxies at all. But there are a few stars out there that pretty much year to year, we can see their slight motion as they simply flow through the galaxy. So are they just like now, taking a picture of the sky and then seeing how that star's position changes from the previous year? Exactly. Right. And one of the, the easiest ways to measure this is if you're looking out of the plane of the galaxy, you can see distant galaxies, quasars, bright other things that are so far away that we can't perceive their motion. So we can use those as signposts to measure other objects moving against. And um, yeah, so there's things like Bernard star that we just look at. And with Bernard star, we see it moving in the sky rather quickly because it's rather close. So it's that thing of when you're driving down the highway, you don't see the mountains really moving mm -hmm. that much past your yeah. window. But those mile markers, they zip past because right, right. they're nearby and the relative motions seem magnified. They're not actually magnified. It's just our perception changes. Um, but yeah, there are stars out there. And the reason I brought up Myra, can we go back to Myra? Are we ready for Myra? Yeah, I just wanted, like, if you're about to say, you know, here's how fast Myra's moving. And then I was going to say, well, how do we know? Well, now we can just refer to it. Proper motion. Video well, speed. okay. Proper motion. So there is, Doppler there is a, another half to it. So I guess I will get to the other half of it. And, and the other half of it is we can take spectra of stars and we can measure... What wavelength does the hydrogen alpha line appear at? What wavelength does the calcium doublet appear at? What wavelength does all these different molecules, when we look at, at their wavelengths, they, they form a fingerprint that can get slid back and mm. forth from red to blue. The spacing between the individual lines stays exactly the same. But what color we see those lines at can change. When an object is moving towards us, those lines all get shifted towards the blue. When something is moving away from us, all those lines get shifted to the red. And so we measure the, the motion in and out of the plane of the sky 
using spectra, we use we measure the motion in the plane of the sky using proper motion. We do trigonometry. And thanks to trigonometry, we can figure out the three-dimensional motion of these objects. Right, right. Okay. Now, I'll let you talk about Mira in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right. Let's talk about Mira. Why Why are you so obsessed about Mira? What's this about? Because, because so so this is a star. It's, it's not totally weird. It's going 130 kilometers per second um, relative to what's around it. But it is shedding its outer atmosphere as it goes. It's a, a asymptotic red giant branch star. It is a kind of variable star. It is working its way towards becoming a planetary nebula, except instead of being nice and polite and sitting still and poofing the material around it, right. it is hauling itself through the galaxy, leaving a train of material behind it. And because we have the capacity to use things like the Galax satellite to look at that stream of material left behind, we can actually start to do things like what was the chemistry of the material it gave off 300 years ago? What was the chemistry <laughs> right. of the material it gave off 200 uh, years ago? And so we can see the chemical evolution of the debris cloud left behind by the shooting star. And in addition to that, it's shocking the interstellar media. So it's basically plowing into the material in front of it. So we have this really cool kinematic picture because you have a fast, it's not outgassing, that's the wrong word, but that's the closest analogy to things you might be familiar with. We have, we have a, a star flying through the galaxy, shedding material, crashing into material, and we can see all of this going on. And we can see the star with our own eyes. And with our own eyes, it's fairly boring. It's, it's changing in brightness and all that, and it's cool. But when you look at that little red point of light, it's at the end of a three degree long stream of material, which means that that little star has six moon widths behind mm. it of material trailed across the sky. That's amazing. So like in instead of the star just sitting there and puffing out its outer layers and you sort yeah. of measure it like tree rings, it is hurtling through the cosmos and so you can see you can just measure it based on yeah. history uh that's that's pretty crazy yeah mira mira is amazing and it's i mean it's it's a type of variable star like yeah it is the quintessential because there are there are mira type variable stars and so right that is the that is the og yeah, it Omicron study is its fancy name. Everyone mm. calls it Myra the Wonderful. That's what Myra means. Yeah. Um, and I love that being Canadian, you say it differently than Mira? I say it in America. Yeah, it's it's yeah. I don't know if that's Canadian. Um, it could just be eh. West Coast. I don't know. Okay. Um, all right, but that is nothing. That is <laughs> that is peanuts compared to what stars can do. So let's go yeah. faster. So, so like I was saying, some of these stars, the the hypervelocity stars, instead of just the high velocity stars, these things are getting to ten to thirty percent the speed of light. Wow! And and these are stars that, in general, have gone through a very rough history. They they were probably part of a binary system, and they got too close, we think, in general, to the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. Mm. And the two stars in the binary plus the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, that's a three-body problem. And one of the stars, basically the, the supermassive black hole said, no more galaxy for you. And when you get a star that's moving 10 to 30% the speed of light, it's not going to get held on to by our galaxy. It is going to leave and keep going. Right. And like those numbers, like 30,000 <laughs> to 100,000 yes. kilometers per second. That's how yeah. fast these stars are going. That is fast. Yeah. Uh, and absolutely. Like I think escape velocity of the Milky Way is something like a little over a thousand, like 1500, I think, kilometers per second. So we're well beyond that. Yes. Now you mentioned 
a possible source of this is getting too close to the supermassive black hole. That that is believed to be one of the sources of difficulty for these poor objects. Right. Um, our our belief uh, that this is the case comes from looking at the chemistry of a bunch of these systems. Uh, we we know of uh, over a thousand now, thanks to a variety of yeah. different uh, surveys, which which. 10 years ago, we thought there were only a thousand out there. Now we know of over a thousand. So it apparently is something that happens fairly regularly. Stars get accelerated. Um, so, so there's known populations of stars that get in close to the center of our galaxy. They have a given chemical signature. When you see things with that chemical signature on a high velocity escape orbit that traces back to the center of the galaxy, it's a pretty good bet that that was a star that formed in the center, lived in the center, and was ejected from the center. But that's not the only way that these stars can probably get this level of an escape velocity. No, that's... The, so there, there's a variety of different ways, uh, like I said. So there's the, the standard three-body problem. There is... We also think that some supernovae, hmm. where you have a close-in companion and the star that goes boom, that through a variety of different effects, ranging from conservation of angular momentum to just the general shockwave of the explosion, you're sending that companion away <laughs> at a high velocity. Right. So, you've, I mean, you've got these two stars whirling around each other. Yes. And then one of them ceases to be. Yes. And the other star is now hurled into space. It has that same velocity that it was going around that other star, but now it no longer yeah. has the the gravitational anchor. It's being thrown like a sling. And and what's really cool is we see both the kinds of stars that get formed during supernovae moving at high velocities and the kinds of things you would expect to be the companion uh, in the case of a supernovae. So it, there are probably cases where you have both stars ending their, their coexistence as they leave behind a now empty nebula of material. And... <laughs> I, I just kind of love that visualization. This is the ultimate stellar divorce. Mm -hmm. um, no one gets to keep the house and uh, off they go. And well, it's kind of a grim analogy, though, right? Because one I'm sorry. Just vaporizes. Well, one might turn into a neutron star while the other one flies away. Sure, so but even that would be a bit of a gravitational hole. It would be a bad day. Yeah. It would be a bad day. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. The kinematics of of all the different things that can happen is is endless in its variety. There there's yet another kind right, of, of save that. It's time for another break. We need all to right. end this on a cliffhanger. <laughs> and we're back. All right. What is the other way that we can get these hypervelocity stars? So, so we also see stars that have been evicted from the things in the outskirts of our galaxy. So these are the situations uh, where you have globular clusters with multi-star interactions. You have dwarf galaxies that have merged together and things get flung out. And in a lot of cases, you'll see these stars that are on highly elliptical orbits moving at not quite escape velocity. They still mm -hmm. appear in many cases, but not all cases to be stuck to us. And, and these are, again, systems where due to mergers, due to close passes, due to high densities of stars, you end up with that three body system or more. More body systems <laughs> right. can yeah, happen. More body. And something just got ejected. What's really cool is while they don't end up on these massive sweeping orbits, when we look at the dynamics of globular clusters over time, they actually seem to beat like a heart. Heart, yeah, that's the right word. Beat like a heart as uh, basically the kinds of orbits that exist in them heat things up and then they settle back down, heat things back up and right. then they settle back down. Kinematics is amazing. So... 
but I mean, these kinds of stellar interactions, they can come from almost anywhere. You you can have yes. a star floating around inside a globular cluster. It gets into some kind of through body interaction and it gets the boot. Um, mm -hmm. You can have a young star cluster because I know that astronomers have recently seen that as well. They've seen yeah. stars coming. And the story that sort of helped trigger this was it was assumed that these hypervelocity stars were mostly coming from the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, but there was a few fairly recently found that are nowhere near the black hole. And so they yeah. had to have come from some other source. I mean, I guess it could be another black hole, a small one. Well, yeah. So this is, this is where there was a really interesting story that came out last week, maybe two weeks ago. Time has no meaning of a dwarf galaxy that was spotted with, uh, for lack of a better term, a proboscis of forming stars coming off of it. Mm -hmm. And this long, narrow train of stars didn't look like your standard jet formed stars, because instead of being highly collimated, tightly held together, close to the system and then falling apart the further away it got like water coming out of a fountain. It was the stars were more scattered near the galaxy and then got tighter and tighter focused the further out. And after follow-up observations and modeling and looking closely, what is thought to happen is three dwarf galaxies or more came together and at one point you had three supermassive black holes in the center of this dwarf galaxy one black hole got flung in one direction where as it went through the intergalactic media it triggered star formation and the other two went in the other direction and triggered shock waves but not star formation mm -hmm. and so this is the full scale version of what right. we see happening at stellar scales with globular clusters with with open clusters with any high density area of stars. We used to think stars couldn't collide. We used to think it wasn't common for stars to gravitationally grab onto each other. It turns out all those things we thought weren't happening, totally happening, totally happening. Um, so there are also, so I guess black holes are a type of star and that, and that story about the, yeah. about the black hole on an escape trajectory. I love that. I love that idea that it's, maintaining a like building a trail of star formation in its wake yeah and you kind of wonder like what impact that has had on other galaxies is this a common thing um yeah so the yeah. other thing is you can get high velocity pulsars yep yeah so so these are where you have that system of a binary um a binary system where one of the stars goes supernova and the neutron star. All pulsars are neutron stars. Not all neutron stars are pulsars. Right. I guess you have high velocity neutron stars. Including right. Including pulsars. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so what's really cool about high velocity pulsars is you have yet another way to get at their velocity. And, and that's from the pulsing of their spinning. Um, you can actually start to get the dynamics of where you have binary systems. It doesn't help with the high velocity, but with binary systems of systems of planets, you can see in the, the changes in their velocity over time that there's an orbit going on. Back to the high velocity part. I'm easily distracted today, apparently. Sure. Um, this, this is what we were talking about earlier, where you have a supernova and, and when it goes you have an asymmetric blast and and star goes in one way stellar remnant goes in other way and you end up with this messy supernova remnant left behind and it's in trying to understand these non-spherical stellar explosions that we've started to pick piece together well let's go looking for the central star oh i can't find the central star go? let's go yeah it should be there. right so expand your view right and often they find these runaway pulsars that again you trace back their their motion and you can follow them back to where they originated that's amazing that you've you've got this star and for some reason, like maybe it's got a binary companion, some mm -hmm. instability in the shape of the star, some, you know, yeah. it's not perfectly symmetrical. And Planetary it, disk. It explodes where one side explodes 
harder than the other side, that it experiences a thrust. Yeah. And so it's turned into a little rocket and away it yeah. goes off into space. And and yeah, so you've got this situation. You've got this this beautiful supernova remnant nebula, like the Crab Nebula or something like that. But like you look at the uh -huh. center of the Crab Nebula, you find the pulsar. But there are these these remnants out there. Empty. You, you look at the center and it's gone. And like one yeah. possibility is that the star just exploded and disappeared. But they're finding them careening Escaping. away from the scenario. And one of the things that I really like about this is that we can use gravitation, in theory, we can use gravitational waves in the future, larger observatories to measure these, the formation of these hypervelocity stars as they're forming. Because what, of what I really, instability. What, what I really love is the basic physics behind this is super simple. You have all the mass tied together and and if the cloud is going to go away asymmetrically, the the momentum has to go somewhere. Right. And so this is purely a conservation of momentum problem. It's a really complicated conservation of well, conservation of energy and momentum problem. Um, it's just cool. Space it's is scary. Cool. Oh yeah, and awesome. Well, sure, but I mean, awesome in the sometimes in the scary way too, like in the in the sort of the full meaning of the word awesome. Yes. All right. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser. And thank you to all of the folks out there in our audience who are keeping the show going by being part of our Patreon community. Uh, those of you who join our Patreon get to get all of our episodes uh, advertisement free. So uh, this week, I would like to thank Planetar, Alex Rain, Karthik Vekatraman, Stephen Kalfi, uh, Andrew Stevenson, Cami Vresian, uh, Sean Matz, Gabriel Galfin, Glenn McDavid, Nat Detweiler, Smansky, Sam Brooks and his mom, Bart Flaherty, The Air Major, Benjamin Carrier, Brian Kelby, Benjamin Davies, Arctic Fox, Lou Zealand, The Lonely Sand Person, Nula, Dean, John Drake, George Jordan Turner, Ruben McCarthy, Ian Abdella, uh, Jeff McDonald, Lee Harborn, Bor Andre Levsoul, Zero Chill, Wanderer M101, Felix Gut, Astrosets, uh, Simon Parton, Papa Foxtrot, and Christian Golding. Thank you all so very much. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next week. <laughs> bye bye. And then, and then they saved. They saved. Six seventy nine. So Arjun asks, do we have any idea what percentage of stars have been abandoned by their galaxies? No. They must have a great view. Yeah, there there's theories. I don't know which ones to believe, and they, they are kind of all over the place in what they estimate. Um Zafan, Zafan asks, do we have any such stars from other galaxies screaming by close to us? I mean, do we, how would we know if they came from right. other galaxies? Yeah. So if they came from dwarf galaxies, we figure it out by basically tracing out the stellar stream of mm -hmm. chemically different stars. So we're, we're able to figure out uh, what dwarf stars we have eaten along the way. Um, but for like your lone star, no. Yeah. Lone stars we can't make sense of. Um, I mean, in theory, but but when you think about the sizes of of the, the distances between galaxies, like yeah. the number of stars that are actually punching their way through the Milky Way, based mm -hmm. on on them being like, you know, you mentioned like astronomers have found over a thousand hypervelocity stars, but when you think about the yeah. volume of space, the aim would have to be terrific to to get that to, to pass through. Yeah. Uh, Helen Kitty asks, do increased spin rates impact gravity around celestial bodies? Ye There's flame, frame dragging. Is that what he's well, I mean, bringing up? So when a, when a star is spinning faster and faster and faster, it'll eventually mm -hmm. like the surface gravity goes down because of. The, yeah, the that's true. Centripetal, which is the outward force. There, there's technically 
only an inward force. It's messy. Okay. But yes. So so the, yes. the areas at the equator of the star have lower gravity than if the star wasn't spinning at all. And the eventually sum of the, the forces is lower. And the, eventually... The it has the same gravity. It's just the sum of the forces sure. is lower. Sure, yes, yeah, yeah. And so eventually the stars will tear themselves apart. Yes. If they go too fast. And there's a couple yes. that are like... There's some pulsars right on the edge. Well, of and doing there are stars it. that are like blobber, like they look like yeah. like uh, UFOs. They're, you know, um, uh, Zephan Zephan saying any star going tempers at the speed of light would stand out like a sore thumb. No, well, no. I mean, like, how do you discover a star yeah. going tempers at the speed of light? You have to examine every star in the field of view, and then you have to measure the the velocity of that star individually. Mm -hmm. And there's only one telescope that far, does that, and that's Gaia. And if it's far enough away, it's that that motion is going to appear negligible to us. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. Anything else? Not that I see. I'm currently noticing my dog has okay. decided to hide underneath a pillow, then but I'll do that the short is irrelevant of the rant because because okay. I'm spoil it for you and the other people. But okay, um, if you haven't already, watch and if you're into Star Trek in any way, shape, or form, if, especially if you love Next Generation, then watch Picard season three. You can you can just okay. ignore season one and two. They are <laughs> garbage. They're terrible. <laughs> season one and two are are just mediocre i mean maybe garbage is too hard they are mediocre all right season three is is really good partly because it's just a good story and they do a really good job of it. there's a lot of really clever little things that they do the writing is hilarious in many cases and the, the way they express the characters is wonderful good. um but the like like the playing on nostalgia is shameless. <laughs> like it is just, it's unbelievable. And yet you're going to watch it. Like you, like the man, like I think the Mandalorian is it's, mediocre. The, um, Oh, what's the other one? That but they you watch did? Grogu and you're like, just, I'll take as much of this as you can feed me, please. Right. Yeah. Like, Oh yeah. Baby Yoda. Yes, please. Like I don't Andor. care if the rest of this. And is terrific. Yeah, that and, one is yeah. absolutely yeah. amazing. So Andor is terrific, standalone. It's not playing on, oh, look at that adorable little Yoda baby. Yeah. Or, uh, boy, you love all these characters. Now you get to see them all again one last time in a way that really gives them a meaningful send off. Uh, no, no. It's uh, so Andor is great as a good story. And I'll, I'll take a thousand Andors. Yeah. But boy, Picard 3 just gets right under your skin and just <laughs> nestles in and just calls your brain home and uh <laughs> and it was uh yeah so i feel filthy for loving it and i loved it and i all right and so if you're on the fence you're like oh i should but i don't want i saw picard one i didn't like doesn't matter doesn't matter picard picard's seasons one through and two just don't exist just just like don't even watch them like if you have dishes to do do dishes. If you Yeah, have, I watched one and I agree with yeah, that. If you have to like if you could choose between something, do anything but watch Picard seasons one and two. But Picard season three is great. It's really good. And yeah. And then they're like setting up what comes next. And they're just like they're setting up so ham fistedly. It's uh yeah, it's kind of extreme. But it's good. I feel filthy. Okay. <laughs> so. <sighs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Quite a bit. <laughs> Phrase of the show is called Star Trek Picard. Nostalgia is the name of the game. Of what I understand, season three is trying to save the disaster of seasons one and two, like making a corpse twitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It's like a frog set tied up to electricity oh, all right have you seen the south park where they have the uh member berries 
No. So they have these characters in these little blueberries that you eat, and uh-huh. they're just like, I member. Remember Star Wars? I member. Remember Star Trek? <laughs> I member. Right? Remember Boba Fett? I member. Right? And that 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 modern media, in many cases, is just harvesting our nostalgia. Yeah. Ready Player One is a banned book now. And that deeply confuses me. I do not know what to do with this information. Texas. Oh, okay. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Not go to Texas. Not spend money on Texas. Yeah. Um, Cherry's saying, I can't watch it because then I'll have watched it and then I can't watch it for the first time. Huh? I get that. I get that. Like you're waiting. You want to savor it. Sure. I can understand wishing that you could be there to watch it something for the first time after you've already watched it. And you're like, man, I wish I could forget all this and then watch it again. Yeah. Good news. You can. You just have to wait a few years. So <laughs> um, Carl and I are going through Bob's Burgers and it's been like 10 years since we watched the first <laughs> season. And so it's just like, I don't remember this episode at all. Neither do I. This show's great. <laughs> <laughs> so so all you have to do is give yourself a Wait. large enough break between the things that are wonderful and uh and you won't remember any of it especially as you get older like it just gets better yeah. and better that that you can just forget this stuff and uh and everything's fine so i watch so. buffy about every 10 years yeah it's time for me to rewatch buffy again all right. On that note, I think it's time to uh, we've we've gone 15 minutes over to give you all uh, the astronomy cast uh, entertainment that you so richly deserve. Uh, what's happening? What's going on? Um, I same old, same old. <laughs> OK, I, <laughs> I, right there is nothing exciting here. I'm sorry. I'm being terrible at self-promotion. No, no. I am planning a conversation with me and two star- SpaceX nerds. Oh, to who you will all know, to try to figure out what happened with Starship. So that should be showing up in a couple of. Oh, hopefully we'll be I want to see that. Next couple of days, yeah, yeah. One yeah. of them likes to fly safe. So, um, all right. I will uh, sort of keep you posted when when that comes together. And plus, I got a whole pile. I pretty much nailed every single interview with all of the people who won Nyack Phase Two. Oh, awards. cool! So very good. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's such great ideas. So I'll be doing all. All those. right. Um. All right. It's time to wrap things up. So thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Thank you for dealing with both our our technical difficulties our our sandwich rant um, yeah ai astronomy cast card <laughs> um and uh we will see all of you next week thanks everyone bye-bye wait i'm the one who shuts this down all right yeah you're the one who shuts it down okay